Our theme of placemaking, placetaking, place sharing, place keeping is perhaps more urgent than ever as we all seek the best ways to build strong, resilient places for the Calumet region. In making this conference possible, we would like to thank our sponsors. Marie Foster Bruins is the president and CEO of One Region, a major force in economic and community development. Under her leadership, One Region has developed Propel, a three-year framework for transformational outcomes in Northwest Indiana. Initiatives related to placemaking are important components of Propel, and we welcome Marie to tell us more about One Region and the importance of placemaking. So Marie, can you uh, come online, unmute and um, tell us more? Hello everybody and thank you Gary and the Calumet Heritage Partnership uh, for giving me this chance to speak just for a few minutes. I'm Marie Foster Bruins and I'm the president and CEO of One Region. We are a 501c3 here in Northwest Indiana and our mission is to attract and retain talent grow population and increase household income. We are made up of business executives from Northwest Indiana and the board oversees me as well as our overall vision for one region. We are a membership organization and uh, that is called the Northwest Indiana Regional Opportunities Council, also called NIROC. And there are over 30 members, all executives from businesses around Northwest Indiana. And as Gary said, we have some uh, priorities that we're focusing on and we are in the process of finalizing that strategic plan called Propel. And the reason why it's called Propel is because as you know, we are at the crossroads of transformation right now in Northwest Indiana with the investment in uh, data and rail. And so we are looking at the best ways to leverage it. Some of those include uh, creating a stronger connectivity from Chicago to South Bend. We're looking at dense housing, especially around the South shoreline to create walkability and vibrancy and promoting innovation and entrepreneurship and other successful placemaking strategies that inherently attract new talent and industry to our region, specifically Marquette Greenway and of course the Calumet Heritage area. One region focuses on placemaking because we know that it is fundamental to economic growth. It's not eyewash or a fun facade. It actually improves the livability of our communities. It attracts private investment, new businesses, and skilled workers. It builds social trust, community attachment, increases property value, and strengthens interaction and cohesion between governments and business. That's a lot more than eyewash, right? And we all know that, that's why we're here. It's a very serious topic that we know makes a difference to our communities. I am looking forward to this year's Calumet Heritage Conference. And um, I love that the program has a huge focus on honoring the past while engaging the present to of course, redefine our quality of place and build community attachment. This is an effort that is very important to our region. And like I said, we are in the moment of pivotal growth and transformation here. And I believe that it all starts with placemaking and, and leveraging what we can in our communities to build a stronger place to attract others to live and play and work here. Thank you, Gary, for uh, having me here. And thank you for everybody being here. And I look forward to seeing what, what's gonna happen over the next couple of days. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Marie. That was a that was a great overview of uh, one region and the dimension of placemaking that, um, that encompasses economic development and may not have often been a focus of, of this conference. But here we have an intersection between heritage, place, economic development and community success. And thank you very much for helping to bring that in focus. Much appreciated. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, the Calumet Heritage Partnership for more than the past two decades 
I'm going to show you a nice picture of one of our great assets in my, in my background, uh, Lake Michigan, a pretty unique part of the Calumet. For more than the past two decades, the partnership has organized events, formed partnerships with like-minded organizations, and promoted the importance of placemaking to economic and community development. In cooperation with many partners, the Calumet Heritage Area has been active for many years. This is the 22nd conference after all. For, and for example, in parallel with this conference, Calumet Voices National Stories is on exhibit at the Gary Library and Cultural Center. This was developed with 15 local partners called the Calumet Curators in cooperation with the Field Museum. And after visiting other sites in the Calumet region, we'll be up at the Field Museum for its 1.8 million visitors per year to see and learn about the Calumet. And that begins in November of 2022. For other activities, you can go to the website www.calumetheritageareaorg under the national designation tab. And there's a download on the conference page that shows many other activities. But calling out one of those in particular, a major initiative of the partnership, which was started over five years ago in cooperation with the Calumet Collaborative and the Field Museum is seeking congressional designation to make the Calumet Heritage Area the nation's 56th national heritage area. And we'll hear more about this important initiative and its status later. Before going there, however, we would like to thank you for the donations that you provided to help support the conference. And also thanks to the Field Museum for providing financial and staff support and to Cleveland Cliffs. And of course, we welcome Cleveland Cliffs to the region. We thank our accomplished speakers and panelists. Mostly, we thank you, the participants, for gathering with us this week to think together about what makes great places work in this great regional place we call the Calumet. A few quick points of housekeeping uh, regarding mostly the, uh, the technology, but a few other points as well. First of all, all times are central time and, other, and only panelists and presenters with their cameras on can be seen by the audience. The audience may use the Q&A feature to state questions that will be moderated by the panel moderators. The chat feature will be monitored uh, for example, to deal with uh, technical issues. For panelists and moderators, when you are not yourself presenting, it's a good idea to mute your audio and turn off your camera. When a panel discussion is occurring, all panelists should turn on their cameras and unmute as appropriate. So here we are gathered together this evening to explore the theme of placemaking and related place keeping, place taping, place taking, and place sharing in the Calumet region. How historically have people made the region home and defined their place in it? How do current residents, groups, and organizations seek to redefine spaces where we live, work, and play? Presentations, workshops, and satellite activities will structure our conversations about placemaking both in the Calumet region and beyond. Here is a quick look at what we're going to be doing over the next three evenings. So here we are at, at Tuesday where we have one panel, the architectural panel. Uh, tomorrow we have a fascinating uh, presentation about the preservation of the past, public history, oral history, and digital storytelling, in addition to regional creative placemaking. And then on Thursday, we have the, the keynote address, which uh, I think you will find uh, extremely interesting. The uh, speaker is Dr. Rolando Hertz, the executive director 
of the Mississippi Delta National Heritage Area. He will help to frame the context for the many great conversations that the conference will provide. And then of course, we wind up on Thursday with the formal presentation. And then on Saturday, there's a self-guided tour of Gary Landmarks. Before introducing this evening's opening session, here is more about the Calumet Heritage Area Initiative. Oh, and we'd like to thank Matthew Kaplan for his wonderful photographs. So the Heritage Area is a place of significant natural, industrial labor, labor and cultural assets. And those are the three major themes that were advanced in the feasibility study, which received National Park Service uh, endorsement for meeting all of their criteria. So what are heritage areas? Well, they're created by Congress and they're places where historic, cultural and natural resources combine to form cohesive, nationally important landscapes. One of the major features of heritage areas compared to national parks is that they are community driven and that it's communities that drive them. It's not the bureaucracy of the National Park Service or the government, it's volunteers that, that make it happen, that create heritage areas and then later managing them. The Calumet Heritage Area began operating over a decade ago, closer to two decades ago, based on a coalition of Indiana and Illinois based individuals that came together to create the Calumet Heritage Partnership which is an Indiana not-for-profit corporation. One of the advantages of heritage areas is that they give the Calumet, which is Southeast Chicagoland and Northwest Indiana, a rallying point around these nationally important stories. Here is the heritage area map. Very roughly, it encompasses the region between the Pullman National Monument in the Pullman District of Southeast Chicago through the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore and on into LaPorte County, as you, and then down to the Kankakee River. So as you will see, it encompasses a, parts of a couple of counties in Illinois and three complete counties in Indiana. And you'll see various dots on this map. And these are various heritage assets that have been identified and that will be incorporated into the, the Cali, and are incorporated into the Calumet Heritage Area as the stewards of important assets of the region. As you can see, almost every community uh, across the Heritage Area map is somehow represented in this engagement map. So what are the advantages of achieving national designation? Well, probably the biggest one is the increased stature, and it's similar to the benefits that were achieved by designating the national, the Indiana Dunes National Park as an elevation from the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. And as Park Superintendent Paul Labovitz said, it's always been spectacular, but the name seems to resonate. And he talks about the crush of visitors. And you see some statistics there that document the increased visitorship. And of course, it brings more publicity to the region as a nationally important region. And there's proven economic impact and a high return on investment. That if we look at the National Heritage Area, the Lincoln National Heritage Area, which encompasses a large part of central Illinois, an economic development uh, impact study showed over $250 million of impact, and they had operating expenses of only $1.1 million in 2017. 
the rivers of steel in Pittsburgh is somewhat similar to our heritage area in that it's in an urban industrial setting and it generated over $60 million of economic impact. And of course, the bi-state Calumet heritage area supports the integration of Chicago land in Northwest Indiana that also is being supported by the double tracking and West Corridor South Shore projects. And of course, uh, it attracts business and population to a recognized nationally significant region. And if we are designated a national heritage area, it would certainly help us to attract additional economic resources to assure sustainability and allow us to expand programming. So the process for national designation is along the following lines. There's a feasibility study that is submitted to the National Park Service that was successfully completed in 2018. We have an operating management plan, a functional management plan that was completed in 2021, but it requires an act of Congress, which means the introduction of legislation in both the House and the Senate. There was a Senate bill drafted by Senator Young of Indiana in 2021, and we have continued to gain the support of over 30 local leaders representing economic, economic development, business, and academic communities. And more recently, we have the support of the Northern Indiana of, of, uh, of, of NERPSI. And the, uh, uh, so that is an organization that represents the political leadership of the various entities in Northwest Indiana. So in short, we have broad support for uh, designation of the Calumet Heritage Area as a national heritage area. I'm going to leave you in this part of the presentation with an excerpt from, a, um, from focus groups that were organized to help in developing the logo and the brand identity. And I think the four key words there, rather the four key topics in the left-hand highlight really capture a lot of the perception of the residents of the Calumet about the region, that you find the unexpected here, that you think of it as a heavily industrial area with no beauty. And the beauty of course then becomes quite unexpected there is the juxtaposition between the heavy industry and natural beauty. It's gritty and resilient. And of course we are creative and innovative. So with that said, I'm pleased to welcome Congresswoman Robin Kelly, a Democrat of Illinois, the second district of Illinois, which is parts of South Chicago and the Southeast suburbs. And she's going to share her perspective of the importance of heritage area and the Calumet heritage area in particular. So in order to do that, I think we need, I will stop screen sharing and Mark, I believe uh, you can pick it up from here. I'm pleased to welcome my friends oh, from Indiana and Illinois to the annual Calumet Heritage Conference. As the Congresswoman from Illinois' 2nd District, I represent about half of the so-called Calumet region, which as you know, spreads across the Chicago Southland to Northwest Indiana, two areas that have shared very important histories. As you know, the word Calumet comes from the old Native American term, which means peace pipe. The peace pipe, of course, was used to bring people from different tribal nations together in harmony to celebrate and affirm their shared values and various commonalities in culture, geography, history, and humanity. And that's what this conference represents as well. I want to commend all of you for participating in this conference. And moreover, thank you and your many agencies for the often unappreciated commitment preserving and promoting the uniqueness and diversity of the Calumet region. Diversity certainly is evident in the Calumet region. For starters, the region is now bookended by two national park sites, 
one, the Indiana Dunes, which highlights Lake Michigan and its beautiful shoreline, one of our unique natural assets, and two, the Pullman National Monument, which pays tribute to working class heroes and sheroes and our historic economic innovation. But there's more, much more, to our diversity than simply sand dunes and factory gates. The Calumet region is also home to many Native American tribes, home to one of America's aviation pioneers, Octave Chanute, whose research with gliders at the dunes paved the way for the Wright brothers' first flight, home to the world's first black labor union, birthplace of America's Labor Day holiday, home to some of the nation's most diverse bird sanctuaries, home to a significant underground railroad station, and home to numerous landmarks associated with former President Obama and First Lady Michelle. Talk about unique diversity. So there's much to share and honor. I applaud the work of all of you, including efforts by the Calumet Collaborative, the Calumet Heritage Partnership, the Field Museum, local communities, historical societies and nonprofit agencies, and of course, the National Park Service for the countless hours you put in to complete the already approved feasibility study and draft management plan for the proposed new Calumet Heritage Area. I look forward to working with all of you and my colleagues in Congress, and especially the newly elected member from Indiana's first district, my neighboring Congressman, Frank Mervan, as we look to introduce legislation designed to formally recognize the Calumet region as a national heritage area. Together, I hope we can all play a bigger role to preserve our story, promote local tourism and jobs, and honor the rich and shared history of this bi-state gem known as the Calumet region. Thanks for the opportunity to welcome you all today. Please keep up the good work and have a great conference. Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome Well, thank you very much, Congresswoman Kelly, for a wonderful job of describing the Calumet heritage area. We are grateful for your vision and leadership on this issue of great benefit to your constituents. And we look forward to hearing the next steps towards national designation of the Calumet heritage area. And now as we move into the opening session of the 22nd conference, let's take a short break to reconvene, try to get any uh, technical issues resolved and we'll come back at 7.40, it's now 7.33. Well, I don't think we'll have a groundswell of objections for kind of working into this a minute early and the panel discussion will probably start pretty much right on time. The um, opening session tonight is a, is a panel that is um, moderated by um, uh, Mary Lou Seidel of Preservation Chicago. And some of the questions that um, will be addressed tonight are, can good places be made? What are the best forms to fit the needs? How can a physical space best fit into a community's needs and desires? And how can historic spaces be repurposed to meet 21st century needs? So I'll leave it up to uh, Mary Lou to introduce the, uh, the other panelists. But for now, I'd like to welcome uh, Mary Lou of Preservation Chicago, who is the moderator of, of this panel. Welcome to the conference, Mary Lou. Thanks, thanks so much. And I think I can share my screen. Yes, I can. Boy, this is going really well. Okay, can you see my cover slide there? I guess not everybody can talk. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, yes. okay, great. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, and then um, Joseph and Louisa, uh, if you're able to go on camera, that'd be great. Um, uh, my name is Mary Lou Seidel. I'm the Director of Community Engagement for Preservation Chicago. And I will be facilitating tonight's panel and participating, um, looking at placekeeping, making, taking, and sharing through an architecture lens. And we'll be talking about uh, new construction and retrofitting of historic buildings in the course of our, uh, in the course of the evening. 
I had to go to. Um, so let me just quickly introduce you to the panelists who are both on camera now. We have Louisa Zhang is an artist and architectural designer interested in the mediation of physical spaces through community participatory processes, mapping, print, and other modes of documentation. She is passionate about equity for artists, access to equipment and resources, and civic engagement. Within her personal explorations, Louisa is interested in the translation of materials and language into physical environments and uses maps, drawing, print, photography, and various fabrication methods to experiment with documentation. Joseph Altshuler is a co-founder of Could Be Architecture, a Chicago-based design practice. He's also an assistant professor of architecture at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Urbana Sorry about that. His teaching practice and scholarship explore architecture's capacity to build lively audiences, initiate serious play, and amplify participation in civic life. Could be architecture's work spans multiple scales, oh, sorry, including designs for urban placemaking, interiors, installations, scenographies, exhibits, furniture, costumes, and publications. Could be architecture's Work has been exhibited at Art Basel, did I pronounce that right? Miami Art Week, the Milwaukee Art Museum, the Elmhurst Art Museum, and the Chicago Architectural Biennial. Joseph's first book, Creatures Are Stirring, A Guide to Architectural Companionship, prompts readers to develop more intimate friendships with architectural companions, and that book will launch this fall. And finally, introducing myself again, I um, work with Preservation Chicago, we working throughout the city of Chicago to save significant built and natural environments. My current projects include leading in community driven planning processes in disinvested neighborhoods to identify what is important to the community and find strategies to get those places to keep those places intact. Prior to joining Preservation Chicago, I was the Chicago field director at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. My focus is on community building and development, which I've been doing for over 30 years in the Chicago area. And with that, I am, here's pictures of our panelists. I will pass it on to you, Louisa, to share, to start your presentation. Uh, thank you, Mary Lee. And let me sure. pull that up real quick. Feels very strange to have an introduction read of me. Uh, Okay, so uh, can everyone see a cyan dot? Hopefully not my presenter notes then. <laughs> okay, uh, so hi everybody. Um, my name is Louisa Zhang and I'm with Leighton Design. Uh, we're a boutique firm of five people uh, and I am standing in for Catherine Darnstadt uh, tonight. So thank you for having me uh, in her stead and she does really wish that she could be here. I know that she means that very seriously. Um, so I, I, yeah, I'm looking forward to this discussion this evening, especially with Joseph, who I knew through SEIC, um, although I never had you as a, as a professor. So uh, I'll just slide through these real quick. Um, let's see here. And hello. So uh, we're Leighton Design. Um, we're an architecture and urban design firm. Uh, our, our projects run the gamut of across different scales. And we start our process in defining the context first surrounding a project because we know that design doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, so to be a better advocate uh, for our clients and our collaborators, our neighbors, our city, we, we work through a participatory approach that leverages local assets to directly generate project opportunities. Um, and, and Catherine, our founder and principal I mentioned, uh, she started this firm 11 years ago through what she likes to say are projects that were as small and as large as she could find. Um, so mostly working in Chicago, some in Chicago land, some in um, other places like Iowa and Minnesota. Uh, but we wanna to talk tonight about uh, the expanded ideas beyond placemaking and in this case, place shifting, uh, especially in the context of preservation um, because there is always a choice that's being made. Um, and, in which we are identifying what stays and what changes, and it's it's less 
uh, that and more um, whether or not this is an intentional and inactive choice. Uh, so we'll start here. Um, this is the YMCA uh, McGaw um, Meta Media. Uh, this is a project that was completed back in 2015 in Evanston. And this is the uh, entry kind of main lounge slash, rec uh, slash recreation slash everything space. Um, it's an existing 90 year old building. Um, and we worked within a 3,400 square foot space. Um, this is the kind of before image and I would just always love to highlight the lovely texture on the walls that we see here and the dark clad uh, wood ceiling that we're looking at. Um, and this is the after view of the, the same view in the after image. Uh, we worked within this limited square footage to make a flexible use program that really allows for a wide range of use for both the instructors and the youth. Um, and using this kind of orange accent, uh, constructing both a, a physical spine that also you know, denote, uh, denotes that this is that programmatic spine uh, that really anchors the community center. Uh, the renovation was not only a project about updating the historic space, but also marked the programmatic shift with the Y toward contemporary STEAM programs. So we really worked closely with the staff and youth to determine the balance um, between the kind of needs that came along with this shift. Um, some needs particularly like kids wanting to enjoy the freedom and privacy of their own recreational time um, balanced with the reality that there's a necessity for staff oversight and facilitation. So you can see that the space moves from a more public orientation to a more private as you move deeper into the, the building. Uh, and here we're kind of, you're able to see how we've hidden that infrastructure out in plain view uh, with that bold orange accent, uh, which also helped us to shift the attention back to the historic structure and reveal this beautiful blonde wood that was encased previously. And I was supposed to insert a blonde joke, but I will leave that as that. Uh, and so moving on to the topic of placekeeping. Um, this is a, a more uh, a newer project um, that we are still in the very early stages of it's the Laramie State Bank of Chicago. It sits on the corner of Chicago and Laramie um, in the west side neighborhood of, Chicago, uh, of Austin. Uh, another 90 plus year old building. It, it's been vacant for years now and is literally falling apart. Uh, has a lot of water damage and things of the like, which is um, just really sad because it is on this really prominent corner. Um, it's also clad in this iconic faux Egyptian art deco style that is really a jewel um, on the west side. Uh, and so this is a question of like, how does this building that's known as a, a kind of quote sleeping beauty of the neighborhood um, how do we keep this because um, the the loss of this building would really just be um, quite sad for for the neighborhood um, so this project was won through the invest southwest initiative from the city of chicago's department of planning and development uh, we won it earlier this year on a team with valeria dewalt train associates heartland alliance uh, oak park regional housing and, and several key uh, programmatic partners. Um, and the adjacent lot uh, next to the bank is currently this underutilized space, which will be uh, come a development of 70 units of affordable housing. And this new construction building will be tied together with the old bank uh, through this open courtyard. And this courtyard will really be that heart of the development as a space for that community gathering and events. Uh, literally bridging that old with the new. Uh, here is an image of the existing interior ballroom and its current state as of earlier this summer. Um, so literally falling apart. Um, and here is that same ballroom reimagined. Um, and while it is a, a preservation project here, and it, we're seeking to honor memories, not only to restore the literal building, but to maintain that community openness and access. Uh, and so this space would be that platform to share memories of that building, of this building, um, which would inform the programming of it. Uh, but most importantly, the role of the community should be used to structure the management and the ownership of this space. And that's, that's really the major key part of this project is 
that the renovated bank will be community run, community led, owned, operated, and profited by and for the community. Um, so our, our program partners include a, a blues museum, which is currently a, a traveling kind of pop-up, um, a co-working space to assist with the economic development, uh, a coffee shop, and it will be a bank again. We're working with a, a bank tenant as well. Um, and this is really asking, how do we use this, uh, you know, on the surface is a preservation project, but how do we use it as a scaffold also for these smaller businesses that need support earlier and, and hope to grow, to move to a storefront that could go down the block um, and really be a, uh, a scaffold of a, a community beyond the limits of this building. Um, so that just ties us back to the, the beginning idea as I started with this uh, idea that our the, the literal building design as just one part of a larger process. Um, this idea of placemaking is about so much more than one project, and we really believe that we can have an impact that is larger than literally the, the building itself. Uh, so, so thank you for your time and attention, um, and you can find our work here uh, and also keep up to date with our involvement with Design Trust Chicago. Uh, which is an, a nonprofit focused on equity in the built environment through projects, policy, and programs. Uh, it's, it's just one of many initiatives that Catherine is a part of. So I'll leave that right there. Thank you. Thanks, Louisa. And you'll be able to stick around if we have any questions after the other presentations? Yep. Okay, great. Um, I forgot to do the, um, uh, you know, the, um, the housekeeping thing, like tell you where the bathrooms are, but I'm pretty sure you all know where the bathrooms are in your own house. So we're all good. Silence your phones, but you can't talk anyway, unless you're a panelist. So I guess we're all good. And with that, I will pass it off to Joseph Altshuler. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you so much, Mary Lou and, and Louisa. It's great to see you. Um, great to, to revisit some of your practices work. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, all right. So yeah, again, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been exciting for us to reflect on the theme of placemaking. And by us, I am one of the two principles of could be architecture a Chicago-based design practice um, that is dedicated to creating what we call seriously playful spaces, things, and happenings in the world. Um, for us, seriously playful uh, implies participation. Um, play is, is an act that requires active participants. And whether it's children or adults or community members of all ages, all of our projects look to find entry points for participation in the built environment. Um, so I'm going, to, so we don't always use the word placemaking, honestly, to talk about our practice um, in architecture and design, but uh, we're taking the opportunity of this conference to kind of reflect on that. And I think for us, um, placemaking is a term that I would say we're even a little bit uneasy about because it has a certain tone of, of authority, the place is to be made, or even that, um, there isn't a place that, ex that exists before it's made. So it's a term we, we maybe have some hesitancy around using, even though many of our practices are aligned with the broader field of placemaking. So we're, we wanna reflect on our work um, in placemaking as something that really always happens within and in collaboration with existing communities. Um, and we're kind of turning to the verb of reclaiming as, as a way that we approach placemaking. So I'm gonna share briefly three projects um, that try to empower communities of different kinds to reclaim space. Um, and, in that, and in the reclamation of space to have a heightened role or participation in place. Um, so starting with reclaiming the everyday, and, and this is a project I wanted to start with because it's specifically is centered within the Calumet region um, in, uh, in a variety of communities throughout Northwest Indiana. And, and the everyday in this project is, is the public parking lot. 
So this is a project, this is an exhibition design placemaking project. This is a project that we work closely with um, the, the Indiana University Northwest, which is based in Gary, uh, and specifically the School of the Arts in Indiana University Northwest, um, which is the, and, and specifically within the School of the Arts, the kind of outreach branch um, of, of the school, uh, a kind of, uh, a unit of the school that's really dedicated to engaging the public in art and culture um, from within and without of the school. Uh, we work closely with, with Lauren Pacheco, who is speaking uh, later in the conference, and her team in the Art and Action Lab to think about what art exhibitions and community engagement means in the time of COVID specifically. And uh, we started working on this project uh, quite early in the pandemic. Uh, in the spring and summer of 2020. Um, and it was a time, especially for an art school, where uh, traditionally a kind of exhibition within a an indoor gallery space as a kind of primary mode of engagement with the public was not possible. Um, and so in this project, we look to reclaim public spaces and specifically the kind of ordinary and everyday spaces like parking lots that within a kind of endless field of, of paint and automobiles, sometimes feels placeless and, and to produce, to reclaim space within that field um, and to make place for their outreach and their art programming to, to reach the public. So the project involves a kind of series of these exhibition display units um, that have interchangeable uh, assemblable parts to create pop-up exhibitions. Um, these sometimes kind of serve the role of a uh, of a gallery wall, a kind of gallery right wall for, for art to be inscribed in. And other times they become sort of cabinets of curiosities where artifacts can be stored. Um, and so kind of through a series of kind of uh, interchangeable and relatable parts, uh, we created these kind of different exhibition units, which we give names also to try to make them even more relatable as companions within the built environment. Um, and that uh, can be assembled in a variety of locations. So not just in Gary, but in these, these units kind of went on tour around Northwest Indiana um, to, to, to bring programming to the people instead of people having to come to the programming um, and specifically to engage outdoor locations at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, you can see one of the sort of cabinet of curiosity units here. Um, and oftentimes these units also directly, they weren't just displaying art as a gallery might in a traditional or precious way, but became opportunities for people to contribute, to people to inscribe their thoughts and dreams, um, for people to adopt, even for the kind of brief moment of the programming, to take selfies in front of and, and to feel some kind of relationship, even within the, what, you know, what we often think of as a placeless character of a parking lot. Um, later on in the pandemic, as, as people began to be vaccinated, as our understanding of the pandemic changed, these things also moved indoors um, and, and created um, kind of platforms to activate indoor spaces as well. So I'll shift to a, a, a different project. In this project, we think about placemaking um, in a very specific historical context. Um, history is... Uh, is not, is not always, um, well, history always has a point of view. History is, you know, famously said, told from the vantage point of the victors. Um, and so in this project, we looked to placemaking strategies as ways of reclaiming other histories, of challenging histories, specifically in this case, um, of a kind of design lineage. So this is a project that takes place within a kind of famous piece of mid-century modern architecture. Um, this is the McCormick House, which is a single family house designed by the very famous, maybe even infamous, uh, modernist architect Mies van der Rohe. It's one of only three single family homes designed by Mies van der Rohe in the United States. Uh, you may be more familiar with the more famous older sister, uh, the Farnsworth House. Um, this is, this is a, a kind of a slightly less famous relative of that house. But unlike the Farnsworth House, which is, I would say famously, um, and if, if anyone knows more of the history of that house, famously 
has a, let's say an uncomfortable relationship with its owner, Dr. Edith Farnsworth. Um, there was lots of both strife with the architect himself, but also with just the, some of the discomforts of living in a glass box. Um, this house actually has more of a harmonious history with the family that originally lived there. And part of the reason for that is unlike the Farnsworth house, this house is actually subdivided into more private rooms with full floor to ceiling walls. Um, this house was lived in for many years comfortably by a family. Um, and it was acquired by the Elmhurst Art Museum in the 1990s. And one of the first things the Elmhurst Art Museum did was they took out all the walls so they could make it a gallery space. Um, so we were invited to, uh, to create a placemaking intervention within this historic architecture. And our interest is in kind of reclaiming some of the original domesticity of the house. Um, and in many ways, reenacting the walls that were removed. Uh, as well as the kind of programmatic functions of the home that were removed when it was converted into a museum. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing the original drawing by Mies van der Rohe kind of in the background and the kind of pencil lines. You're seeing in black the lines of after the museum removed many of the walls. And then you're seeing in pink a kind of reenactment of those walls um, that we uh, in this placemaking installation rendered with bright pink curtains, um, which is at once both a kind of homage to one of Mies van der Rohe's um, underappreciated and sometimes uncredited collaborator, Lily Reich, who um, was very kind of uh, well known for innovating the use of, of curtains in the making of space, but also as this kind of bright tropical juicy color palette is also in a way kind of challenging the preciousness, the pristineness um, that we know was kind of important to the architect and, and reinscribing some of the intimacy, the joy, the color of, of family life that we, that we, that we know occurred here. Um, so this, this is a project that's not meant, this is not a restoration, this is not a conservation, this is not a project that's showing you what the house looked like, but it's a project that's reenacting perhaps what the house felt like. It's a project that is, um, maybe through exaggeration, but is, 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 helping, um, is, is helping kind of reclaim the domestic family joyful history of this home. Um, so we, we, through both the curtains and these kind of mint furnishings, we, we reenact scenarios of, of social life that may have occurred here, a kind of chess table in the parlor, a kind of exaggerated, um, an exaggerated kitchen counter and the kitchen in the galley kitchen, a puppet theater in the kids' room, and a bed that visitors are kind of permitted to, to lounge and rest, maybe even nap, um, and get intimate with in a kind of public gallery space in the bedroom. So one last project, and then I'll, I'll turn it back to Mary Lou and we can chat, um, is, is placemaking the common. So if in the first two projects, like our approach is very much about shape and color and form. In this project, it, it's really not, it's, it's, it's less about architecture with a capital A, it's less about hard materials, and it's really more thinking about the activities that take place in, in, in our spaces, in our cities, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. Um, so this is a project for a 5K run, which uh, I admit as an architect, uh, feels a little bit out of my purview. Um, architects aren't trained to design runs, um, but nevertheless, we sort of, um, we were inspired to kind of lend our kind of skills and understanding of the city, of design, of placemaking strategies in a softer way to think about the role of an athletic run um, in a neighborhood. So th this project had an ambition of kind of bringing together audiences in unexpected ways. I, I should say as an aside, there's dozens and dozens of 5K runs in Chicago. There's no shortage of them. Um, but the, the kind of distribution of where 5K runs are, are, are fairly inequitable. Um, most of them are on the north side of the city or in the center. Um, so a kind of an adjacent, this wasn't necessarily the primary ambition of this project, but certainly part of the agenda and priority of this project was um, to bring a kind of exciting 5K run um, to a place that didn't have a lot of 5K runs, um, but that has a very robust and rich running culture. So for us, like 
placemaking, broadly speaking, is always about collaborating with community partners. It's always about co-creation. Um, it's always about stewardship um, and reclamation over ownership and authority. This is a project that was a deep collaboration with, with community running groups on the south side of Chicago, specifically um, Men Run These Streets and the Black Chicago Runners. Um, so the project starts on an urban scale with um, and has this kind of conceit of bringing together culture enthusiasts and athletic enthusiasts. Um, so it's part architectural tour, this kind of launched in tandem with the Chicago Architecture Biennial, but is also a kind of, uh, a kind of earnest athletic competition as well. So the route isn't maybe the easiest to follow, but our attempt was to take the, the kind of distance of a 5K run, 3.1 miles, um, and to connect the greatest number of Kind of important architectural landmarks, in this case in the neighborhood of Bronzeville and Washington Park in Chicago, um, which inevitably led to a kind of circuitous and, and slightly difficult to follow route. Um, so it's a project as much of event planning as sort of asset mapping of, of sort of tour routing. Um, part of the project was kind of creating kind of abstract drawings and graphics and branding for these buildings so that not only are you seeing the real life building, but you also kind of, um, uh, there's also this kind of system of wayfinding and graphics that point you to it through kind of large banners and graphics that get dotted throughout the neighborhood. Um, and inevitably some people did get lost. Some people did, uh, we, we, we spent so much time sort of celebrating the architectural landmarks that we probably didn't do our due diligence in just providing the basic directional arrows to show people where to go. And so some people kind of fell off the trail, but that for us was, uh, while not intentional, was like still a kind of um, a success because it, it led to even more exploration of the neighborhood. Um, it led to, and, and in the most kind of basic sense, it led to a kind of reclamation of the streets for a brief moment where the streets were not primarily for automobiles traveling through the neighborhood, but was really for runners um, to, to take uh, temporary ownership of and even to perform it. Like for us, a run is kind of a performance. It's not just a kind of simple athletic gesture, but it's a way to express oneself through the through body and space, um, uh, through the joy of, if not setting a record of, of, of coming to a kind of athletic accomplishment. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, super happy to, to chat. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joseph. You know, I'm, before I start with my short presentation, <clears throat> in January of 2020, I signed up to do the Chicago Marathon. And since it got canceled, they, uh, I was about halfway through my training when they canceled it. And they said, you know, we can roll your, your uh, enrollment over to next year. I was like, I am never doing anything like this again. So I'm going to run my own marathon. And I did it from Roseland through South Chicago. I did the whole 26, actually over 27 miles past uh, historic places and neighborhoods that the Chicago Marathon would never run through. And it was just extraordinary. And we ended at the Central Park Theater, which is in my presentation, which I'm about to share. So it's well, a great- I, Just yeah. a quick response to that, if you'll allow me. Yes. Um, I would just like to say that the, the 5K run, I and mean, that resonates a lot. The 5K run is was actually, I mean, I didn't go into this backstory, but was in many ways a proof of concept for what we hope to do in the future, which is to kind of organize marathons around cultural themes. Um, so like this is a kind of, uh, we love the Chicago Marathon. The Chicago Marathon was this past weekend. Um, I have some intimate, some intimate connections to some marathon runners whom I love to cheer on. And as much as I love the Chicago Marathon, I think it's actually kind of boring that Chicago Marathon does the same route every year. Yeah. Um, so kind of per your anecdote of making your own marathon, like our, we have a kind of broader proposal of a different marathon every year for the Chicago Marathon that's organized a kind of cultural or heritage-based mm -hmm. theme. Um, you can see some examples of that here. And I don't mean to hog the I can stop no. sharing and stop hogging the stage. But in many ways, the 5K <laughs> run was a kind of proof of concept for actually a much yeah. kind of bigger ambition we have for the relationship between running, uh, heritage, culture, and placemaking. 
That's beautiful. Well, Mary Lou, just to intervene as the moderator for a moment and take the prerogative to ask a question. Uh, You know, I think about the industrial past of the Calumet and some of what what was, you know, what what was presented by uh, Joseph in a wonderful presentation. And so how would we create the feeling of the industrial Calumet in the modern world? Uh, in order to appreciate the feeling of what was without recreating the physical presence of the past? Wow, that's a good, that's a good question. We'll bring that, we'll bring that to the end. I think that's a good question. I mean, I I can answer it quickly. I mean, there's a lot of different ways. You can have uh, big, you know, banner displays. You could project the image on the side of an existing building. Or, or project the image, um, and I'm sure uh, Joseph and Louisa would have better ideas, but uh, I think that's a really interesting and interesting idea, which we'll get to in a moment. I, I'll make my presentation quick because I still think we should try and end. We're supposed to end at 3.30 or 8.30, correct? Gary? Or... Well, yes, that, that, that's correct. That's but we, okay. we, got, we got started a little late. And so that's okay. We, but like we don't want to keep people beyond. too late. because No problem. Yep. Well, I just want to give you a very quick background on Preservation Chicago. We've been around for almost 20 years or a little over 20 years now. And we are committed to strengthening the vibrancy of our historic built environment, which includes buildings and landscapes. And for us, um, it also includes cultural uh, culture trying to get my pages. Uh, So whenever I think of placemaking, I think of Times Square. And I don't know if anybody has ever been to Times, anybody here who's been to Times Square before the 2000s, when it was just a mass of cars and traffic and loud noise. Um, And then I, I can't remember in this story who did it, but some small individual or organization said, hey, we have this idea for a one-day placemaking event. Let's just for one day close off Times Square to all traffic and set up tables and benches and performance stages um, to see how people react. And this is almost the same angle, I think. Let's see. Yeah, look at that. They did it for one day, and it was such a big hit that they made it permanent eventually. But they were sure, the planners were sure, if they had gone to the city of New York and said, we want to forever eliminate cars from Times Square, they'd have been like, get out of here. (laughs) But since they came to them for a one-day placemaking event or a short-term placemaking event, the the city could see it and see how beautiful it was. So to me, Times Square is a great uh, example of placemaking in a community. Now, I'm going to talk about some relatively, this is a very modest uh, event, uh, uh, project we're doing right now, also in the Austin neighborhood, Louisa, um, uh, on the west side of Chicago. Um, But all of our work starts with a community who cares about its history and wants to reuse a building, right? We don't love buildings because they're, just because they're pretty or we like art deco or we like, you know, Rome, Richard Sonian Romanesque, they're buildings that are, are especially beautiful because of the place they have for people, that they're meaningful to people. So this little house you see here in this picture is, um, we believe we've researched, is probably the oldest structure uh, original to Austin that still stands. Um, there is a house, the Seth Warner house, that's about to be landmarked. Um, But this house, we believe, by looking at construction techniques, is even older. It was part of a farm complex uh, when Austin was a big farm. It survived the Chicago Fire because the Chicago Fire wasn't anywhere near it. Um, Austin wasn't even part of the city, but the fire was much more uh, centralized to the uh, downtown and Gold Coast areas and the near south side. So we... When we, we, when we discovered this house and it's in terror, you know, what you see here, see if I can point my, this is the middle of the house collapsing on itself. So it's not in really great shape. It, it collapses from the front all, or the side all the way to the other side. But uh, we thought it would be worthwhile to ask the Austin community 
and reach out to some partners and new partners. Actually, all the partners we're working with in Austin are new to us um, and say, hey, we got this 700, 800 square foot building. It's in somebody's backyard right now. It's going to be demoed by the city if we don't do something with it. So we've worked with Territory, which is a youth group, um, Austin coming together, uh, Roots, oh, I, always, I always forget the other group, Root to Fruit, and then Alt Space are the four main groups that we're working with to try and, and now in this case, the students will design a reuse for all or part of this building. We're either going to move all of it, uh, either disassemble and move it all or disassemble what's really salvageable and create a new space, uh, which pays uh, tribute to the to the historic space. So to me, it's just phenomenal. And these youth are, most of them are high school age. They do still have some college age students in their program as well, but they design it, they vote on it, they help fundraise for it. Uh, we're obviously all going, all the groups are going to con contribute to the fundraising initiative. But this is, to me, uh, the way you make a space in the most organic way possible. Um, and in this case, uh, I, I, we're pretty confident it's gonna happen. So um, here's the back. So these are some of the, the, there's dormers on the side and then these back windows were our first indication that we weren't dealing with, uh, what were they, Stanley garages? <laughs> like in the 60s and 70s, this ain't no Stanley garage. There's something going on with this place. So it's on a new foundation, there's a basement, you know, it's been moved, but the siding and the, the structural elements were all there. So it's really important for me personally and for Preservation Chicago that um, we seek out community wherever we go. So if we don't know, we didn't have a lot of people that we were connected to in South Chicago, or I'm sorry, in Austin, but you just find one or two people and then you ask them, who should I talk to next? And um, we, uh, we keep branching out, right? It's, it's basics, basics of community organizing. And I personally am, tend to be a little more um, resistant to authority figures. So I tend to seek out uh, community members that, that the alderman wouldn't necessarily recommend I talk to, right? So we wanna make sure that all the voices, as many voices as, as can possibly be, captured are, are brought into this. And in almost, and, and in every case, it becomes this great collaborate, collaborative work. So again, we, um, in this case, you know, this youth group territory is not about historic preservation, but the students are about designing spaces that will make, be safe places for them to gather and learn and grow, designing spaces that will um, use up some of the vacant lots that are in their neighborhood, uh, vacant city owned lots. So it's, we find groups where for this project, our missions align and then we work together. Central Park Theater in North Lawndale. This is a great one. Now, if you look at the front of this building, you see some um, perma stone is on the front. You know, you won't, you won't know it from this picture, but in the early 1920s, there used to be little towers on top of these caps here. There was a big sign across the front way here. But this theater was built by um, the team of Balabin and Cats. They were great movie palace creators. They partnered with uh, the architectural firm of Rap and Rap. And anybody in the Chicago area has ever heard of the Chicago Theater or the Uptown Theater or the uh, those two particularly um, are also Rap and Rap. Balabin and Katz collaborations. The King's Theater in, in Brooklyn in New York was also a Balabin and Katz rap and rap. But the Mothership, their very first collaboration was the Central Park Theater in North London. Now, when we talked to the city a while ago, they were like, mm, I don't know, the integrity is not there. It, the interiors painted a different color. They were using all these like like uh, old school preservation arguments why this shouldn't be uh, created into a, into a space or elevated it into a Chicago landmark. Um, so we just kept on planning ahead anyway. Some people came in now in the early 70s when this stopped being a theater, um, the Church of House of Prayer Church of God in Christ bought the building and they started having services there. Um, this is what the interior looks like now. It's not original colors. <laughs> 
God forbid, you should change the color of the interior paint. Um, the interior of this building while it was a theater was transformed two or three times. So, but um, we came up and you don't have to read all these. I just put them up there because in our first meetings, we agreed to some really core values that this collaboration needed to follow to both respect the North Lawndale community and respect the um, House of Prayer Church of God in Christ, which owns the theater um, and has their services there. But all, you know, the church was very adamant that we want to work toward a preservation outcome, but we want to retain, um, you know, majority ownership of the building. And, and most other partners who came in to try to help them said, oh, sure, we'll work under that premise, but in two months, we're going to try and convince you to sell it to somebody else. And we agreed that we were going to do everything we could, even if it means potentially someday creating condos for the different space. Um, we hold those principles and core values and any, any new organization that wants to join the Central Park Restoration Committee has to agree to all of these in writing. This is our group. We, uh, we started forming right before the pandemic hit. So for a year and a half, most of us had never met each other face to face, but we've put together this amazing collaboration of organizations and architects. I don't know. Uh, Louisa or Joseph, if you know Ann Louie here with Future Firm, she's a rock star. Uh, Jewish United Fund, School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the church, the North Lawndale Historical and Cultural Society, and then Max and I representing Preservation Chicago, and Jake is with the Jewish United Fund. Um, it's, going, it's coming a long way, but it's creating, it's turning this place back. So we had an event there on September 18th, and the whole point to me of a placemaking or um, type of event is to activate that space and show people what it, what it was like and what it could be like for the community. I'm also a big fan of incremental preservation where, you know, if we go back to the front of the Central Park Theater, um, there are two storefronts here that could be activated almost immediately with fairly minimal restoration work. So working with the city to try and activate, because if you start activating these two, you get a little bit of income, people start coming. The Central Park Theater is a place to go. We also are talking to a couple of, uh, at least right now, one theater group wants to create a black box theater in these first two or two, the, the second and third floor of the building. So again, that's a use of space. That's not the main theater. Um, and we can sort of uh, move along and, and create those those spaces that will get us to the long, long, the long-term goal. But again, we, it's such a wonderful part partnership. So that's all I have. We're actually ahead of time. Um, I see a lot of things in the chat. Let me see if there's any questions. I, it would be, thank you, Sharon, for the nice compliment. Um, So Louisa, Louisa, you answered the question that was in the in the question and answer about um, about who opened up that process with the Laramie State Bank, which is also in Austin. Um, but one, what? So there was a question about who initiated that. Was it a, was it the city, the community, a developer, an architect? Um, and that's all through the Invest Southwest program that Chicago has come together with under our new mayor and pretty much all new heads of departments. I can't think of any commissioner of any department that's the same under Mayor Lightfoot, but they just pulled as many resources as they could get together, um, found sites in these 10 community areas and said, we wanna um, solicit RFPs to, to reactivate this space again. So um, Laramie Bank, yeah. yeah. Do you wanna talk more about that? Yeah, I actually I think it's a it's a good question to kind of um, kind of bring together the three of our practices because it feels like uh, this question of of ownership. Uh, I think we've all shown projects that kind of varied in its different ways that ownership was involved in the project. And so for the Invest Southwest uh, example of the Laramie State Building, the city did not own the building, or the city did not own I, I should say the the larger lots adjacent to the bank. Uh, um, and so part of the process 
even after the, the RFP had already been issued and um, you know, there was a call for uh, project proposals and it was only after um, the process had started did the city start conversations about acquisition, right? Um, and Joseph, you had mentioned uh, specifically thinking about stewardship rather than ownership. Um, and in, in Mary Lou, in your case of uh, the Central Park Theater, you're working directly with the owners um, in, in res resistance of kind of dismissal of the, the building. So I, I think that's a kind of lovely start question um, across the three of us. And I, I guess if either of you can talk a little bit more on uh, what the what the role of control and ownership is in, in these projects. You want to start, Joseph, or do you want me to jump in? Sure. I mean, I think it's a great question. I think um, I think for us, at least in the projects that I was talking about, like they're in in each of them, they're isn't a single owner exactly. I guess in the case of the Elmhurst Art Museum, the Elmhurst Art Museum owns that building. Um, so that might be a, that might be a, uh, an exception, but in the case of, in the case of a 5K run, I mean, yeah, the city owns the streets, but the, the community also feels stewardship and kind of sense of collective over those streets. Um, and in the case of the arts and action lab and the mobile exhibition units, there may be owners of the individual parking lots, but it's not a matter of a kind of capitalistic, the owner is trying to get a return on their investment. Like it's a matter of trying to bring as many people who have a connection, who have an affiliation, who have a kinship with these spaces to have an opportunity or to have, in some cases, a physical platform, in some cases, a more programmatic platform to occupy those spaces. Um, and I mean, I think in the case of like a more, uh, let's say a more formal development, like there, there often is ultimately a more capitalistic owner, but I think we could I think there are other models. I don't think that has to be the only model of how these kinds of projects can be developed. Yeah, the, um, the, um, with the Central Park Theater, um, it, is a, it is a daily reminder for us that uh, we're doing this, uh, we're bringing our expertise and our time and talents to the community to fulfill their vision. So we're collecting oral histories uh, oral and audio video histories of uh, people who grew up in North, North Lawndale, you know, African Americans who grew up in North Lawndale um, after the after they were allowed to live there because we had very restrictive housing covenants in Chicago where black people could live. Um, before that, it was a very, uh, very um, traditional Jewish community. And a lot nowadays, a lot of the former synagogues like the Stone Temple Baptist Church was a synagogue and uh, it was an extraordinary synagogue, but when they converted it to a Baptist church, they made sure to leave a lot of the Jewish symbols um, and significant um, architectural details in the building so that both histories could be um, honored equally. But it, for us, it is all about the community and it is all about, um, it is all about letting them plan their future. They know almost always uh, in my experience, they have all the community has always known what they need, and they know the barriers. And so many times, developers come in and just say, you know, like, well, and most often, Louisa, I'm sure you've seen it somewhat in the Invest Southwest. In the Invest Southwest program, they have to check a box. We had two community meetings, and 40 people came to each meeting. So therefore, we engage the community. And I'm like, mother, I'm not going to swear today. I swore I wasn't going to swear. But that kind of stuff makes me lose my mind. You know, when you just decide all I have to do is have a have a meeting, bring the sign in sheet and I can check off the box. And if the community asks me, you know, our biggest thing is this developer is going to leave in a year when they're done. This guy who lives here, you know, there was neighborhood 
that when I used to work in Bronzeville in the you know late 80s, early 90s, very distressed at the time. Now, most people I know couldn't afford to live there because it's been completely gentrified, which is another day, another conversation for another day. But um, the community has to drive it. The community has to, we, we did a community planning process for new, new single family homes in Bronzeville that we invited. We had 40 people who came to every single meeting and they were three separate meetings where we designed the exterior and the interior of a, what, what would became a two flat building, but we wanted the community to look at it and, and approve it because A, someday they might be the home, they might want to buy this place and, and B, they've lived here for 25 years and they're going to drive past it every day on their way to work and it shouldn't look like crap. It shouldn't look like crap. That's just all. People shouldn't have to drive past crap. And, and it's not hard for developers to make that shift. We have two firms right here, Louisa's and Joseph's, that do extraordinary work. And Louis with Future Firm, same thing. They're willing to get to be there and work for the community. And it, it is always better for the community. So, sorry. Um, I think it's a good segue to um, Casey's question in the chat on, on how do you find the balance between preserving past and modernizing a space. I, I, I think that also kind of ties back to the original question you'd asked of what's a what's a good project. And uh, to your point, I, I appreciated Mary Lou when you started the, the the beginning of your your presentation of Central Park Theater of here are the values, right? And so like. The, um, the values that was set forth by the, the community is what we're going to be measuring what a, a good project is going to come out of this. And um, I, I, you know, in the case of the Laramie State Building, there are some things that cannot be preserved because it is not structurally sound. <laughs> and or, right. but like, you know, is the lime green paint on the outside something that one person would like to preserve and one person would not like to preserve? So that's, you know, uh, this decision making of what is important to to keep and leave behind, I think, is not a choice that you can be neutral on, right? Um, and right. so, uh, yeah, I, I, it's a not really, I suppose, an answer. But um, you know, there there are some things that are are, are structurally not able to stay. But um, I appreciated too, Joseph, your project presentation on on choosing to highlight the heart of what. The, the home was uh, rather than specifically, you know, any architectural feature. And that's that's a preservation of some sort, you might say, or a reclaiming to use your word um, that, I, that I really enjoy. Yeah, yeah there's, um, I mean, there's the Central Manufacturing District, which is along, uh, well, the, what, the Western District is along Pershing um, around West, between like Ashland and Western. Beautiful, grand. This was an extraordinary manufacturing district. You know, most of those uses are not going to come back in that way or at that scale. So what do you do with those buildings? You know, there's there's one, it's a cold storage facility. The entire face of it has almost no windows because it was a cold storage facility. Um, uh, but you know, we're we're big fans of, yeah, you need 21st century uses, but 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 ultimately, you know, if there's, we're we're pretty important. It's pretty important to us to maintain the exterior of the building because again, that's a history that people walk by. That's that tells you what this space is, and it tells you that it's grand. If you, uh, a lot of developers, I'm, and it's for us, it's a very last resort. I personally feel like it's it's like ripping somebody's face off and sticking it on a new body without stitching it. But the facadectomies, you know we're gonna save the front door and we're either gonna make it the front door of our big glass building or we're gonna put it, we're gonna put the front door inside the building and make it the mantle for our fake fireplace or, you know, that kind of stuff gets to me. But, you know, if that's the very least we can do, it's the very best we can get out of it, that's great. But I, um, but you know, in the interior of the space, um, if it's not some really pronounced um, design, like, you know, I think about the library circulation room at the, the cultural center in downtown Chicago, um, with the Tiffany domed ceiling, you don't really want to take that out. <laughs> That's pretty big.
Did I did I freeze or did Mary Lou freeze? Like no, you 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 are unfrozen. Gotcha. I think, I think um, but you know you can recreate those spaces in a lot of different ways in Sonics. Yeah, sorry. Why don't you go ahead, Joseph? My internet is unstable again. <laughs> I mean, I think I just to chime in really briefly on this topic. Like, I think for us, preservation is. I mean, and we're all for preserving historic facades and a facadectomy can be really cool. But I think for us, like preservation is not always a purely visual practice or a practice of visual replication of what something once looked like. And I think we, we, we like to kind of challenge the idea that like preservation uh, can be much, much broader than just what something looks like. And in fact, even if you radically change what something looks like, there's ways through kind of organizational strategies, through programmatic strategies, through cultural strategies to highlight um, the identity uh, and the inner workings of an institution, of a place, of an organization that once was um, through kind of precise celebrations, reenactments, and other and, and sometimes quieter, just kind of pointings to things that occurred there that may not, that may look quite different in a contemporary context. Um, so yeah, I guess I just, I wanna plug this idea that preservation isn't a real factor. Uh, quick, quick question regarding the uh, financing of your projects. The, uh, as you know, the National Park Service has, um, primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, requirements for historic uh, tax credits. So how do, how do you interface with, uh, with historic tax credits as part of the components of financing your restorations? Yeah, well, the, if a building's listed on the National Register and it's income producing, right, there's all kinds of has to meet the Secretary of Interior standards, then you are going to be looking at, you know, um, concerns about um, the materials used, especially on the exterior. But I think that's improving a little bit. Can you guys hear me okay? I know my screen keeps freezing up. So, um, you know, if it's a Chicago landmark building, there's even stricter um, guidelines to to. But we think the but we think the the federal and state historic tax credits are a great benefit when and especially when they can be layered with low income housing tax credits. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you do have to meet those standards, the Secretary of Interior standards, and it has to be listed on the National Register. So the Central Park Theater is listed on the National, or we're we're listing it on the National Register, and we're gearing it up for a for a Chicago landmarking. Great, great. Do you have any uh, closing comments you'd like to make? I'll, I'll leave Louisa and Joseph to start. If you have anything you want to wrap up, I wanted to quick. I see there's a in the Q and A there was a question that I yep. can respond to. Please, there's a mm -hmm. question about about how projects translate between indoors and outdoors. Um, and the, the question is, have you designed projects thinking they can be presented both indoors and outdoors? The Billboard Buddies project translates. What about the Elmhurst project? Is this design approach helpful to community, community engaged effort on your end? And I think um, it's a really good question. I think, frankly, I, I tend to have, and this is just like my kind of personal affinity, like I actually tend to gravitate towards uh, placemaking interventions that actually are indoors, which I think is maybe at odds with kind of the field at large, which often thinks about kind of public plazas or, or thinks about public spaces as primarily an outdoor kind of endeavor. Um, and I think I actually have a natural attraction to indoor spaces because of the, uh, because of the capacity for indoor spaces to generate intimacy. And I'm really interested in, in, how intimacy plays a role um, in community engagement and placemaking and making people feel attached. Like intimacy has a way of, of really conjuring our inner feelings and memories and making us feel cozy and comfortable. 
and feeling like a companionship to making us feel companionship with the environments that surround us. So I think if anything like COVID and the challenges of being inside, especially early on in the pandemic kind of challenged us to, to migrate strategies we were already doing like at Elmhurst on interiors outside in the case of the billboard buddies, for example, um, for Northwest Indiana. And certainly that's a project that's meant to be both in and out. But I think for us, it's like, how do you take that kind of inner cozy interiority, something that is very visceral in our connections with memories um, and, and to translate that to outdoor spaces as well that maybe um, in and of themselves don't always have that intimacy. For, uh, the key thing is that intimacy, intimacy is so important to, to memory, to heritage, um, and to the feeling of stewardship, not ownership. Mm -hmm. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's that a great answer. comment. Yep. Uh, Mary Lou, Louisa, closing comment. Excellent answer. Louisa, do you have anything you want to add? Louisa, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I really appreciate um, being invited to participate in this conversation. Thanks for having us. Well, it's been a wonderful session. Gary, before you wrap it up, can I can I wrap with one more thing? We yeah, are absolutely. working. Sorry, we are working with. We have been working with. Um, both Lathrop Homes on the north side and Alt Gelt Gardens in the Calumet uh, region, um, honoring the hist history of those public housing developments, uh, saving those places, even though in many cases they're uh, examples of really poor policy and um, you know building these buildings and then leaving them there to essentially fall apart and not maintain them or take care of them, but. Um, you know, especially in Alt Belt Gardens with Hazel Johnson was probably one of the, she's in a, was a renowned, nationally renowned uh, environmental activist because, you know, with Alt Belt Gardens, they're like, hey, you got some raw sewage you want to dump somewhere? Let's open something down by Alt Belt Gardens. You know, you have a, a metal scrapping plate, anything, any pollutants were being located in places like Alt Belt Gardens. So, Hazel Johnson um, is, a, is a great figure there. There are some cool buildings and, and that, um, that entire area is being uh, advanced um, to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places now. And we hope ultimately it will be, for all Gulf Gardens, it will be a Chicago landmark eventually as well. Well, Mary, Mary Lou, of course, you have the uh, the Yan Tan connection there with the Underground Railroad, right, at all Gulf right. Gardens. Not, not to mention the fact that it's where Barack Obama got his start as a community organizer. Yeah, right. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of history in uh, Alt Geld Gardens that certainly deserves to be preserved. You know, yeah. I, I'm 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 wondering what it's going to take to get the three of you to take a tour of the Calumet region with us and help us to identify the same kind of landmarks that you've identified. Uh, throughout uh, other parts of Chicago, not, not that you've ignored the Calumet. No, but, well, but, Gary, I'll let I'll let Joseph and, and Louisa, but I've been involved, and I have certainly uh, I Tyrell Anderson. I don't know if he's still on the call tonight, but with DK Devils, oh, I spent a lot of time in Gary with Tyrell, and um, I worked on a homelessness plan for um, Porter County, Indiana. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, we're quite familiar, but yeah, no, it's a great, I mean, I think it's, it's phenomenal to help people see outside of their yeah. very narrow lens, uh, when they think about, you know, when they think about, if you look at that map of Chicago and say, um, what do you think of this place? People would be like, Ugh, that's what I drive through on the, on the, um, skyway to get to Michigan. <laughs> oh, yikes. Have, no. uh, have uh, you visited the city Methodist church ruin? In Gary? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, is that, I should ask Tyrell. Tyrell, is that the one we did on our one by tour? He just got him. <laughs> well, I'm only... almost a boomer. I'm on the cusp of being a boomer. So my long-term recollection is very limited, but <laughs> Tyrell, well, all... he's much younger than me. He might remember. I, I'll tell you the reason I mentioned that is because where my parents were married. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
you know, in, in 1940. Yes, Tyrell in, says, yes, that's the, ch in that's 19, the church. I've in 1947. So there you are. So, well, if there are no further closing comments this evening, I would like to extend a huge thanks to you, Mary Lou, and Louisa, and Joseph for an absolutely phenomenal start to the 22nd annual Calumet Heritage Conference. It's, it's been enlightening, it's been inspiring, and we really appreciate uh, what you've offered us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. I feel the same way about being here, so I'm glad to help. There's a great group of people involved. I'm going to put up what I hope is the schedule for our next couple of evenings. And uh, uh, Terrell, you, you were mentioned. And so you're going to be hosting tomorrow evening. And, you know, actually, when I thought about the ownership question, I thought very much about Union Station in Gary which I'm sure you're going to have a word about tomorrow and in which is something that you have been so active in uh, preserving as an important cultural asset of our city. So with that, with that said, and putting up the schedule for the forthcoming events, I thank everyone for their attendance this evening. And I hope that uh, you're able to attend the other sessions, which I think will be equally stimulating and equally, equally interesting and help you to better understand about the heritage of the Calumet region. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. Have a pleasant evening and good night.